Welcome to Inside Radio. I am your host, Danielle Agnew, and you are a fly on the wall to everywhere. Hey, everybody. It's so great to be here with you. I am so excited that I finally can breathe and don't sound like Marge Simpson. Oh, I'm just, you have no idea. If you could see me right now in my mind, I'm doing cartwheels. And they're the straight up and down kind. They're not the flop over, fall over kind when you're five. Okay. So it's great to be here with everybody. I am loving being here. And I'm going to dive right into our topic today because it's really packed. And I've been getting so much email on this one particular topic. It is so fascinating. I swear tides of consciousness go through people at one time. So I'll start receiving all kinds of email regarding one topic from so many different sources. And in this case, I've had all kinds of people asking me from all kinds of parts of the world, Danielle, can you talk about demons and what they really are? Because it seems like everybody has a demon, and that just seems kind of weird. I mean, are these demons really that pervasive? Really? Now, it's important to note that I feel that a, a great amount of our demon freakout or demon obsession has to do with media at this point. You know, a lot of our paranormal shows love to drop the word demon, the word demon. It's a demon. It's a demon. There's a demon in the basement. Oh, there's a demon. And there's different shows with different investigators and different psychics and certain people really, really, really make everything about the demon. And certain shows really make everything about the demon. And the reason they do that, gang, is because generally they have a line producer in an earpiece in their ear saying, is it a demon? Say demon. It's a demon, right? Could it be a demon? Well, why don't you think it's a demon? Because human beings are so freaked out by the idea of demons. Now, you know, I'm not trying to be harsh on these shows because I, I, that would make me a hypocrite. I've appeared as a psychic and a medium on a lot of these shows that are paranormal, paranormal shows, you know, where I'm in there trying to figure out if it's a demon or a ghost or what the heck it is. There I am. So I'm not saying that the, the shows are single-handedly why we're obsessed with demons. We're going to talk about why we're obsessed with demons in America and other parts of the world, but really in America. Yet I do have to call my paranormal programming on the carpet, you know, for allowing misinformation to get out there. And quite honestly, for scaring the crap out of people for absolutely no reason, because they're trying to keep a show on the air. And people are really bored of looking at infrared black and white photography of nothing happening, you know, except for somebody going, I feel a cold spot. So do I. Do you think it's a demon? I don't know. I mean, really? Really? Really, TV? Now, I do know that uh, there's a lot of producer friends of mine that are trying to actually educate people through their television programs on what spiritually is out there, okay? Yep, our show today is about demons. What are they? Where'd they come from? Do they even exist? Or is this just some weird buzzword that gets people to watch the rest of the 17 minutes of people wandering through black and white hallways looking around blankly in the air on paranormal programming, okay? The bottom line, you know, there are dark entities. Of course, there are dark entities because there are light entities and our entire universe is filled with all kinds of life. That's like saying, are there any fish in the ocean that happen to have a blue tail? Well, yeah, you know, it doesn't mean they're evil. It means their tail is blue. Demonic entities or chaotically dark entities, chaotic darkness is an energy signature that exists because it is literally on a slower bandwidth than light. Now, if you were a creationist, if you believe in the God of the Bible, of the Christian Bible, you believe that God created Lucifer as the angel of light. And as the, as the Christian lore goes, Lucifer got really upset because he had to bow down to people And we were kind of tools, and it made him bent out of shape, and he didn't want to. So God, you know, and of course, as as the fan fiction goes, God said, well, Lucifer, you either bow down to them or I'm kicking you out of heaven because you're being disobedient. And Lucifer said, well, no way, God. I mean, stick it in your ear. I'm not bowing down to a bunch of weird monkeys that evolved out of the mud and are picking their noses and picking their butts, and I'm not going to do that. 
And so as the story goes, God kicks out Lucifer and says, well, you're disobedient. And then Lucifer flies back to heaven and tells everybody, hey, guess what? God's using you. You're being manipulated. And then all these angels believe Lucifer, and then God kicks one third of heaven out, and they fall to earth. Okay, those are cliff notes, but that's basically what happens in the story. So if you believe the Christian Bible as a literal piece of literature, then you believe that God created a beautiful angel who got bent out of shape, who went on a tirade, took one third of heaven, and fell down to the earth because they got the boot out of heaven for being dis disobedient or insubordinate. Then if you go on to follow the lore, uh, that said angel is now super mad at God. So all these angels that fell down with Lucifer, who's the head angel, the, the, the bright morning star, the beautiful angel of light, they all decide that now he's the big boss because they're used to worshiping God. So now they need somebody to worship. Now it's going to be the bright morning star, which is Lucifer, which is now the devil. Okay. So we've got to keep up with the character arcs here. So if you're following Christianity, then the devil comes about and gets really mad at God, just like the girlfriend who's been kicked out and is stalking the ex-boyfriend, you know, sleeping in the sweater day in and day out, smelling it, rocking back and forth, turning the light switch on and off. And that's Lucifer and God's sweater just sitting there going... I hate you. I hate you so much. I'm going to kill your children. Everything about it. I'm never going to let you go. I'm never going to let you go. Okay. That's so that's so single white female is what Lucifer turns into and then proceeds to stalk all of God's children, which is humanity, letting all the angels, which are now demons, because remember, they're not an angel anymore because they got kicked out. So now they're demons whatever. So now those angels are running around and now they've turned into evil beings and their whole goal, because Lucifer tells them what to do and they're just mindless angels, so they're doing what they're told, is to make the lives of human beings terrible because Lucifer's so mad at God. So God's, you know, Lucifer's going to be creepy, passive, aggressive and lash out at all of God's children because, you know, Lucifer knows that it can't go right at God, so it's going to go at the kids. Just like the creepy single white female in the movie would just drive up and pick the little girl up from school, and the little girl doesn't know that mom and dad broke up. And so cool, awesome girlfriend mom, who is actually the psycho who boils the bunny, says, oh, let's go to the mall. And she's texting pictures of the little girl to the crazed dad going, look what I have, I have your daughter. <laughs> okay. Are you kind of following how odd that is? All right, but that's the story. If you're a Christian, that's the story. And if you're a Christian, then like traditional Christian, obviously, a literal Christian, then to this day, Lucifer is running around with God's sweater on, passive aggressively trying to ruin every human being just to give the big bird at God and just to say, see, see, I hate you. Blah. Well, I think it's a fascinating way to look at humanity. And I think really, it really shows that humans are really quite full of themselves to think that there would be this entity out there that would be so obsessed with us because God wanted, ready for this, God wanted the angels to bow down to us, okay? So not only, and so keep in mind, in the Bible, we are the most incredible, incredible thing ever to ever be created according to the Bible and according to God. So much so that God wanted the angels to bow down to us. Okay. Well, and if you do some biblical study, what you can find out there is that the angels were not supposed to necessarily bow down how, and submit, as in to be ruled by. Uh, more the biblical translations were to, to be equal to or submit with. In other words, to share space with. So somehow in all these biblical translations, as the churches went down the road and you got to remember now, Christianity is a wild, crazy offshoot of uh, a much more ancient religion called Judaism. And we stole in Christianity Judaism's Torah and made it the Old Testament and then jacked it up in its translation, which does not make a lot of Jewish people very happy, I'll tell you that. So here we have the Bible, the Christian Bible, talking about a jilted devil who hates God's kids because the devil got dumped, okay? And then we've got all these angels running around polluting people's ideologies and spirits and minds and possessing them and whatever because they're mad at God. Well, now what's interesting is that, when you, again, when you do look at that biblical translation and it actually means to be in existence with or to make room for 
or to accommodate humankind. God wasn't saying, you know, bow down to these, they're my finest creation. God did say God was pretty proud of creating us at this point, according to the Bible. Yet when I talk to angels about it, these angels aren't bowing down to me. Do you know, I've never had one angel bow down to me in my 50 years of being alive. And I talk to angels all day long. I translate for angels all day when I talk to clients. That's what I do. And those angels aren't over there bowing down to humanity. They don't feel like we're God's shining creation and there's some maggot that has to just serve us like a really bad hotel maid. I mean, we've made the story that way because A, we've mistranslated the text. B, we're a little bit narcissistic as a species, in case you haven't noticed, just ask planet Earth. And C, it's part of our learning curve to make us the center of the world to figure out who we are in the world as a species, okay? You got to remember, we're a young species, people. Young, young, young. We are a young species. Now, I'm going to put a pin in all of that to come back around to the side here and say, are there dark, chaotic energies whose energy signature is so chaotic and so heavy and so slow and so rooted in weird, what we would consider a pain vibration are are there uh, that live in a, a a weird dimension of ickiness? Is this real? Is it even real? Well, yes, that is real. There are those entities that are dark, that are heavy, that thrive on chaos and pain. They are real. Now, I'm very careful to unbraid this for you before we start talking about it, because here's the deal. Are there dark, chaotic entities or demons? Yes, there are. Are they singularly out for humans because they've got it out for God and light and everything else and all they want to do is destroy it all because they hate it? Okay, that's getting a little... um, We're starting to get into fan fiction there. When I have dealt with demons, they don't want to be around me at all. Okay, they don't want to be around me. You know why? Because I feel awful to them. Now, I'm not asking you to feel sorry for demons. There's no need for that. There's no sympathy for the devil here. They are created to be the way they are for a reason, and we'll get into that in a second. Yet demons don't want to be around me because I have a very, very high energy signature, as most human beings do. And I generally am walking around with a group of angels. Now, angels and demons cannot be in the same place at the same time. Why? Well, because if you turn on the light in a dark room, the darkness is gone, right? Okay. We, because literally the, the spiritual physics of light and dark, light is traveling so much faster than darkness that it literally obliterates it. It just obliterates it. So no living creation, vibrational or otherwise, good or evil, if you want to call it that, wants to die. You know, everything that's alive has on some level a spiritual or biological survival instinct, including darkness. So chaotic darkness or evil or demons, they don't want to be around me any more than I want to be around them. So how do people get possessed? How, which is very super rare, by the way, and we're going to talk about that too. How do, how do houses become infested with demons? And it can happen, but it's really rare. Well, I'll tell you, you know, if you are a Christian, and we'll go back to the, the, the Christian belief system, and I'm not making fun, gang, I'm, I'm actually a pastor, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a pastor, so this is why I'm familiar with the whole fan fiction about, you know, the devil and all these things. Is there evil out, or, or a dark vibration, or chaotic, or uh, sociopathically narcissistic vibration out there? Yeah, there is, yet it's not a devil, per se. And it's not calling the shots like a mob boss. There are many of these entities that are out there, and they're yucky. Well, newsflash, we feel yucky to them too, okay? We we are like oil and vinegar. I mean, the two just don't mix. Have you ever poured vinegar on baking soda and you watched what happens? That's what happens when you put light on darkness. It is the vinegar on the baking soda. And if you'll notice... After you pour the vinegar on the baking soda, it makes all that fizz and all that whoosh, and it's a big fat drama and it's huge. And hey, man, if you're five and you put some red food coloring in that, you can make a volcano. Just saying. 
or if you're 25 or maybe 55, but I digress. What we're looking at here is after all those foamy suds cascade down the volcano, what is left? Do you see the baking soda or do you see the vinegar? Well, you see the vinegar. Okay. So now these are the most wide brush strokes possible on earth because we're already 15 minutes into the podcast and I'm only on Christianity and we have other things to cover here to talk about demons and demonology. Yet I'm starting with Christianity because most people, not all people, but most people in the United States were raised with some sort of Christian background or at least knew about it or your mom dragged you to church at least on Easter and Christmas. Um, And that's not as popular anymore. But it's important to note that when light hits darkness, it obliterates it just like baking soda. Darkness doesn't stand a chance. So the baking soda doesn't want to be around the vinegar. It's trying to move off like a cockroach. It's trying to move and scurry and scuttle all over the floorboards. And you'll notice if you are a psychic, a medium, a sensitive, an empath, a human who can feel anything, if you walk into a room that's got that demonic presence or that chaotic darkness presence in it, it feels very, very heavy. It's called demonic oppression. And sometimes the air can feel kind of sticky. Oh, it's so gross. Oh, I mean, it just sucks the air right out of your lungs. It is nasty. And the reason that's happening is not because darkness is so powerful. It's because a concentration of those chaotic dark beings changes the physics of this third dimension or the ether system. And that's where we get ectoplasm and all kinds of other things that happen because the atmospheric changes in the room are responding to the vibrational or wave sequence changes in the atmosphere. We're talking dimensional stuff, okay? So... What are demons and why do they exist? If God is all powerful, if God is love, what is a demon and why is it here? Well, even if you look at the very interesting, uh, I like to call it the, the, the Satan myth in the Bible, not to say that there's not demons in a dark place, because there is, but we'll get to that. However, the way it all kind of played out got a little creative there, which is okay, which is okay. In the Bible, I'm talking. However, why would God create Lucifer in the first place if God knew that Lucifer was going to, A, be a prima donna, turn into Zoolander, freak out, wear a tutu, and bring a third of heaven down to earth just to wear God's sweater, rock back and forth in the corner, flick the light switch on and off, and torment humanity forever until getting captured and thrown into a fiery pit for a thousand years. Why? I mean, if God knows everything, and God loves humanity so much, And if God, according to the Bible, told all those angels that they have to bow down and worship human beings, because we're so amazing, don't you know, then why would God even create a Lucifer? Why not just skip that step and move along and just remain in the Garden of Eden forever, right? (laughs) So I always found that, as a pastor, I always found that part so interesting. As somebody who studied, I'm like a theology weirdo. I love cultural applications of different religions. Now, I've mostly studied Christianity and a little of Islam because they're, they came from, you know, Abraham, both of those religions. So anyway, why would God do that? Well, you know, God is sort of a fantastic architect if you do believe in God, and there's a lot of people that don't. So for our discussion, because we're, we're going off of the the Satan myth in the Bible, and again, I say the Satan myth, yes, there's dark, yes, there's evil, yes, there are heavy hitting demons out there. There's all kinds of things. We'll get to that. But the way it plays out in the Bible is a little, you know, like God created the earth in seven days kind of thing. It's, it's just somewhat of an analogy. Let's put it to you that way. Why would God create Lucifer? Well, if you'll notice about God, God's an incredible scientist. And if we're going with the God persona here for the sake of our discussion, you know, God makes art. God makes sunset. God makes physics. God makes the quantum universe. God makes kind of everything. And you'll notice that God makes it so God can put its feet up and go sit on a beach and drink a beer and the system kind of runs itself. That's what evolution is. That's what the Big Bang was. That's what leaves decaying into the bottom of a forest floor is. Recycle, reuse, repurpose. Everything in nature is used and recycled. Absolutely every single thing. Because not only... Is God a great artist with those sunsets down on Huntington Beach? Yet God is an awesome scientist and pretty smart 
and likes, I'm pretty sure, to drink beer on a beach. So it's like God made a perpetual motion device with nature, and nature kind of takes care of itself. So if nature recycles everything, and we are a species of almost 8 billion people, and as a species of 8 billion people almost, we now know, thanks to Albert Einstein and many other great geniuses of our times, that energy is not destroyed, it's only transferred. So we have nearly 8 billion people having nasty, crunchy thoughts coming out the top of their head like a big black, dark smokestack. And all of that energy that is not destroyed but transferred is just hitting the ether system, hitting the ionosphere, hitting the quantum field like big old black clouds. Now, most people are so programmed to be miserable that they're wandering around. And I want you to think of somebody's head. They don't have a head anymore. We just have a smokestack. And out of that smokestack is just billowing black smoke when we're unconscious. Because we're not aware that we are polluting the ether system to the degree that we are. Well, now, if we're to go with the God theory, God's infinite wisdom, God's looking at this going, oh, man, that's a, I'm going to have 8 billion of these things running around the earth. And, oh, it's going to be a lot of etheric pollution, negativity, anger, rage. If it's all just sitting out in the ethers like that, they're going to breathe it back in. And since energy is transferred, it's going to make them more rageful and more terrible. Oh, God. I need the tilapia of the spiritual realm, says God. I need something that's going to go through those ethers and eat that crap out of the vibrational sphere. I need something that's going to consider all of that gross, disgusting, emotional poo coming out in black smokestacks from the top of these folks' head who are not awake enough and aware enough that they're actually part of me and they're going through their own separation experiment over there, being mad and angry and eating their worms. I need something that's going to clean that up. I need a spiritual scrubber, a scrubbing bubble that's a spirit thing that eats that stuff up and repurposes it for something. Well, geez, if I'm going to do that, it's going to be necessary to probably create a dimension where all of that goes because I can't, you know, it's not going to go away. It's, it's got to go somewhere. Hey, well, maybe, you know, fear and chaos and rage and anger, it's really heavy. So if I create this dimension over here that's really heavy, then the beings that live in it also have to be heavy because that's not going to make any sense if they're light beings. They're, they're going to obliterate the space. They have to be just in that same place. So let's go ahead, and here we've got these demons. And we're going to start it with good old uh, morning, bright morning star Zoolander over there. He's going to lose his ever-loving mind when he runs out of hair care product in heaven, and boom, we're done, okay? Now, obviously, gang, I am wrapping this in a biblical perspective because demons in Christianity are referenced in the Bible, right? So what are demons? Well, chaotic darkness does live in a vibration or an ether or a dimension that is a hell vibration or a chaotic darkness. However, hell itself, as referenced in, uh, you know, the New Testament, um, hell itself doesn't even exist in the Old Testament because the New Testament in the High Greek that they wrote everything with was not conversational Greek. It was fancy writing Greek. So by the time we needed to translate all of that, we were losing some translations for that particular aspect of Greek. That's the bottom line, okay? So remembering that Christianity is a wild offshoot of that very old and stable religion called Judaism, and remembering that the New Testament was written approximately 99 to 300 years, depending on whose book was what, after the death of Jesus, all right? So it was written a long time after that. It was just mostly verbal stories that were passed down, and then somebody said, Oh, man, these stories are really getting weird. And we got Jesus riding a unicorn in one, and we got Jesus going to Mars in another. We better start writing down the predominant stories here. So that's how we got the New Testament, by the way. It is in the New Testament where hell is referenced. And let me just tell you something. It is a mistranslation in Jesus was basically talking to everybody and said, look, you know, if and I'm really, really paraphrasing here, but if you act up and you act like a jerk, then, you know, you're going to end up, you're going to take your spirit to a place that's, that's like hell. Well, actually, the word wasn't hell. Jesus was referring to an actual physical place on earth. 
that everybody knew about. And that place was disgusting. It's where people disposed of garbage and bodies. And they would, it was like a valley and they would light all the garbage and all the bodies on fire and it would constantly stink. There were constantly fires rolling down there. It was disgusting. It was completely gross. Okay. So Jesus was trying to use that gross, disgusting, like the town dump, that gross, disgusting place as an analogy to say, hey, if you act like a jerk, then your spirit is going to feel like you went and lived in that gross garbage dump. Okay. That is how oppressive it's going to be. And we also get the idea of a fiery hell from Dante's Inferno. We also get the idea of a fiery hell from Revelation in the Bible, in the Christian Bible, which is one of my favorite books. It's so weird. I think John ate bad mushrooms and just went off while he was getting like visited by all these angels. I love it. So there's John and he's in a cave and he's writing all these things. These angels are coming to him, showing him the end of the world and what's going on. And it's very intense. And actually, in all seriousness, John probably didn't need to eat those wild mushrooms because I I see stuff like that too. And it, angels just don't really filter stuff. Okay, you have to consider that the same being that's an angel got kicked out of heaven, according to the story, fell to the earth, and used all of that power for chaotic darkness. So what does that tell you? It tells you that angels aren't, they don't have a big filter on them. So it pr- probably John was not sitting there high as a kite on mushrooms, but I just think that's funny. Anyway, so there he is writing about the end of the world, and he talks about how Lucifer finally gets a rain on the earth, and evil just has a heyday for a while, and God's people just need to be patient because it's just going to play itself out. And I kind of think that's where we're about in the world, although it could get worse. It could get a lot worse. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes back, uh, written on his thigh, King of Kings, by the way. I don't know why on his thigh, but maybe he got a rad dog tattoo at Venice. We don't know. But there comes Jesus and his rad dog tattoo that says King of Kings, and here I am. And uh, he comes down and kicks the devil's butt and throws him in a lake of fire. It is He is thrown in a lake of fire, okay, according to Revelation. So we have Jesus talking about you're going to go to this, don't, you know, you're going to be sucked into this gross place. And the actual name of the place was misinterpreted as Hades or hell or the underworld, because remember, they were translating out of the high Greek. And what did the Greeks have? The Greeks had Hades, the underworld, right? And actually, Hades wasn't always a bad place. It wasn't super sunny. It was under the ground. But it was just where you went when you died. All the good people and all the bad people went to Hades. They went to the underworld. So we've got a lot of cultures, as you can see, all right, we're 27 minutes into the podcast, and you can see we're mashing up these cultures like mad at this point in the Christian Bible. We're mashing up Jewish tribal history. We are mashing up Greek translation and Greek, uh, really, mythology. So by the time we get to demons, and by the time we get to translating what Jesus is talking about, who is saying, don't act like a jerk, are you going to feel like you walked through that dump over there, and now you're all stinky and gross like a burnt body, ew, Now we've got hell. Now we've got this idea of a crackling pit where demons live. Now, is there a dark dimension where there is chaos and pain and remind you of a bad scene out of phantasm? Yeah, there really is. Do human beings get pulled there? You know, it's never been my experience that a human soul can actually make it to hell because we still, even when we're pulled out of our body, we still are made of light. Now, You got to remember that a lot of the hell mythology was there to keep people in line too, you know, kind of like the village by M. Night Shyamalan, that there's this devil out in the weird creature out in the woods and it scares kids so they actually stay inside the walls. We have natural consequences for acting like asshats and cause and effect in the spiritual realm is huge. If I'm a jerk, jerky stuff is going to come around. And I'm not saying that there aren't dark beings out there who are feeding on our jerky stuff. So what happens? What happens with that? Well, if I'm somebody, and I'm a very angry person, I'm an unawake person, I'm an unaware person, or maybe I'm just a person and life has been really hard and all I know is anger, okay? I'm still a being of light. And so am I going to get drugged to hell? Probably not because that's the vinegar on the baking soda. I'm going to get drugged right through the doorway and shine a big light on everybody and that's going to suck for everybody that's in hell. So it's unlikely I'm actually going to be drugged to hell. However, I am going to attract dark entities whose job 
was the tilapia of the spiritual realm, whose job is to come by and eat all the dark junk out of the ethers that I'm putting into the air. And those beings are, they, they, want, it, they want us producing dark junk because that's what they eat. Now, now, in case you don't know why I'm referencing a tilapia, and I don't mean to wreck tilapia for you, but tilapia are wonderful flaky white fish that we eat in tacos and squeeze our lemon on and add a little butter. Tilapia eat bass poo. They're poo eaters. They're bottom feeders. Tilapia eat poo. Most fish eat poo, unless they're predator fish, okay? And even those predator fish eat poo. So just, just, you're welcome. You'll never get that out of your mind when you go to sit down to order tilapia at a restaurant. Like you'll just see his bass poo. But I reference them because obviously the tilapia system is made to break down the poo and use it as healthy fuel and it creates healthy meat in them and it's all good, right? Well, create chaotic darkness eats pain out of the ethers. It eats our anxiety. It eats our freak out. It eats our dismay. And it translates that into energy into its own realm, which is a slow realm, which is a low vibration, which is what we would refer to as hell. Yet I don't like to call it hell because I happen to know that's a mistranslation in the Christian Bible. So it is this dark, heavy, awful, phantasm-like, I'd never want to go there, I'll tell you that, straight up, vibration where these beings dwell because the vibration is like them. So they eat our dismay, and they they just wiggle back to that place. They can't stay in the realm of light very long because it begins to wear on them. It begins to be the vinegar to their baking soda. Now, I want to be sure to make sure that I am delineating the fact that our dark entities real? Yes. Are, quote, demons real? Yeah, they are. Are they specifically after humanity because they're mad at God? Well, not really. They're hanging out with us because we are a species that freaks the frick out all the time about everything. We are a fear-based species. So we're constantly barfing fear into the atmosphere and these beings are coming by. They're like, oh my God, I got to go hang out on earth, man. That is the golden corral for crap. These people walk around spewing crap all day and they don't even know it. I mean, it'd be like, gang, it'd be like if we went to New York, seriously, and people were invisibly handing out the best deep dish pizza everywhere. Everywhere you went was a fresh deep dish pizza, just fresh and beautiful with the cheese bubbling and getting crispy on top. Literally, how fast would you text your family and friends? Oh my God, there's free deep dish pizza everywhere in Manhattan. You got to come. Ah! I mean, Manhattan would be overrun, okay, with people getting free pizza. Earth is free pizza for entities that eat pain, okay? So, Now that you understand that demons aren't specifically after us, why is it then that people can be tormented by demons? You know, if if they are not after us specifically, why have people reported scratches, growling by the side of their bed? Why? Well, I'll tell you what. You will notice that demons don't usually show up in people's homes who have no idea what they are, okay? Okay. You got to look at some of our Christianity that's got a little sideways. We have taught people to be terribly afraid of these beings. We've even taught people that demons and the devil are more powerful in people's lives than Christ. So cling to Jesus like a little life raft in the sea of evil that's trying to eat you like jaws, okay? That's a lot of the Christian uh, dogma uh, up until extremely recently with many churches. So when you think about that, what you're teaching people is that there's this monster at night, this monster in the dark that's going to come eat you because it's so powerful. And, and by the way, we also teach people, you won't be able to tell it's a demon. You won't be able to tell. It'll look like an angel. I get this all the time from people who do not believe that folks should be speaking to angels or to spirits or anything all the time. I receive information of, you know, these very well-meaning people who are considered themselves very Christian who will write to me and tell me I'm being deceived by demons. Well, it's really hard to mistake an angel and a demon. It's kind of like mistaking an orange and a Jeep Cherokee, okay? They, they're just different, man. You can sit in one, eat the other one, really. So it's weird. However, when you're taught that you won't be able to tell the difference between a demon and a something— 
When you're taught that the demon is after you, when you're taught that it's the scariest, most powerful thing ever, and it's so powerful that even Jesus was tempted by it, that's how powerful it is, you have now created the ultimate monster in the psyche of humanity. Way to go, Christian church. Really? So we've got this psychological monster now that's completely your worst nightmare, and you're afraid of it because you can't see it. You don't know if you can tell if it's it or not, or your mom, or an orange, or a Jeep Cherokee. You have no idea what it is, but you know it's coming for you constantly because it hates you because it hates God. (laughs) God, really? Wow. So the reason I'm bringing this up like this is because what does that do? Well, it instills a great amount of fear in people. And what do chaotic dark beings, what do demons eat? Fear. So demons are attracted to it. So the more afraid you are of demons, that they don't know you're afraid of them necessarily. They're just like, oh, rock on, they're afraid. Cool, let's go eat that stuff. And there they are. Every living thing needs to eat something. All right? So the reason that I like to debunk the mythology around demons. Are demons real? Yes, they are. Are they nasty? Oh, God, yes. Oh, Lord Almighty. Do they stink? Yes. Do they growl? Yes. Are they terrifying? Absolutely. Are there different ranges of them? There absolutely are. Are there kind of head demons like there are archangels? Yes, they are. And I'm not going to say their names because they don't deserve the press, quite honestly. Yes, they are. However, they are real Yet, once we understand and put demons in a category more like sharks, sharks are real too. Yet, they accidentally eat people, but they're not actively hunting people all the time. Now, let me tell you how we get all of the demons off of the earth, is we stop feeding them, okay? We stop being angry, rageful things that are just in this constant state of duress, putting out black smoke out the, 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 the top of our heads that these things eat, They will go away. They will find another ether. They will find another planet, another dimension. They'll stick with the people who are feeding them, whatever. Yet when we have this pervasive idea that we are helpless against this darkness, that is bullcrap. And it causes a lot of fear, which brings in the demons. So we're creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, it's important to note that there are many people out there um, not tons and tons, but there's there's a lot of people out there who are open channel mediums and they have no idea that they are. Now, what is an open channel medium? Well, I'm a medium. I'm a pretty open channel, except I'm familiar that I am one. So I don't let other people in my body. I don't let spirits in my body. Angels have zero desire to crawl inside of my body. They'd blow it to pieces anyway. That would be like a hamster in a microwave. Not a good look. So, you know, they don't want to. I don't have that relationship in my channeling with my clients or with businesses or the world or people or whomever to actually embody a being. However, say you're somebody who is raised um, in, in a pretty religious situation and you you are not given the gift of knowledge around how the chakra system works or how open these particular energetic points are. And they are very open. And so if you're wired to be an open channel medium and you don't know it, and you're somebody who is just freaked out about a number of things, it could be anything. Maybe you secretly are harboring fears or you're anxious or you live in a home where there's a lot of abuse or just icky, yucky stuff that would cause a person to feel icky and yucky and anxious and and nervous on the inside. Well, you got a pair of swinging saloon doors on your back that you don't know that you have, that entities can come and go in. And hey... You're awesome. You're full of food. So in the rare cases, and I say rare because they are rare, of actual demonic possession, it takes several of those entities, not just one, not just two, several of them. They all have to kind of lock arms and get a big running start and run into that person. And they have to take turns kind of rotating inside of each other because the person on the outside is getting burned with the vinegar, okay? Because that human spirit and even the human flesh is so light. I mean, light, not as in light colored. I mean, it is made of light. Biophotons are the light that emanates out of our brains. We are light beings, gang. Humans are light. Demons are dark. So, okay, in a rare case that you have an open channel medium that has no idea that's the deal, and they're full of fear, and they've got an open swinging door on their back, and 
these ga- these entities gang up on them. You know, that is rare and it can happen, yet it's not typical, okay? So when we talk about demons, how do you keep them away? You don't engage the fear. You don't engage them. And it's important to realize, too, that, you know, demons appear in different cultures. Obviously, Christianity isn't the only place where you find them. What's interesting is, you know, we have so many factions of Christianity, not not all of them, obviously. We have many factions of Christianity that are very anti-Islam. They think that all Muslims are terrorists. You know, it's just such a weird issue of non-education there or lack of education, or they just don't want to be educated because they want to believe what they want to believe. Well, rock on with your bad self. Yet in Islam, you know, it's really interesting because it acknowledges you know, the, 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 the base concept of icky spirits and evil spirits, okay? And one of the big icky spirits we hear of that come out of Islam are jinn. And you may have heard of jinn. They, they've been made very popular on paranormal TV shows. Oh, I've got a jinn. It's a jinn. And people say, well, what is it? And they say, well, it's an Islamic demonic being, okay? Actually, before I get too ahead of myself, well, I'll tell you exactly what a jinn is. Yet in Islam... They, you know, refer to the jinn um, and a couple of other beings. And what's interesting is that the Christian Bible in the New Testament, because the Old Testament is not talking about demons. It's not. It's talking about a couple heavy hitter, you know, demonic presences, but it's not going on and on. You don't hear about demonic possession until you hear about Jesus. Then you hear about demonic possession. All right. And Jesus cast, I think, 63 times, roughly, depending on the translation, it's used Uh, references to demons in the New Testament, okay? So what's weird is you've got a religion where the new savior's coming in and meeting up with these demons and casting them out all the time. You're really not hearing about demons. You're hearing about Lucifer. You're hearing about darkness and being tempted and, and icky devil things, but you're not really hearing about demons until you get into the New Testament. So in contrast, Islam, um, there, the followers are not I guess, mandated to believe in demons. Um, you know, there's six articles of the Islamic faith, and and none of those articles demand that you have to put a demonic presence or a jinn or the other two beings in a main space to give a contrast as to why you need to cling to Allah, okay? Think about that. The Christian Bible does, Muslim, the Islam, uh, Islam does not. You know, it's... It's, I mean, they assume that there's a demonic beings there. It's kind of an assumption because where there's light, there's dark. So Islamic theology makes room for dark beings. They're just not saying that you absolutely positively have to believe in them to give credence to Muhammad's teachings or to Allah. Whereas in a lot of our hardcore Christian faiths, they are saying, if you do not acknowledge the presence of the devil, then you are being deceived by the devil. Think about that. You know, there's all these Christian churches out there that would listen to this broadcast and tell you that I am I'm working for the devil, trying to convince you that the devil isn't real. Actually, I just explained to you that there is a chaotic darkness dimension full of those beings that do torment people in, either, in order to eat our pain. And they don't as much torment us as they come around us when we're in pain, and they actually will push... They will wait to see which of our buttons we push in ourselves to create the pain, and then they'll hang around and wait till we push those buttons, and then they'll agree with us. In other words, if I really am afraid of nuclear war, whatever, and I watched a nuclear war show, and I put all this fear and chaos and paranoia and freak out into the ethers, and the demons came and ate it. And they're looking into me, because demons, remember, they are, they are spiritual and supernatural beings. So just like angels, they can see inside of you, okay? Angels can too. Whoopie-doo. So can I. So can other psychics. It's hardly a superpower. So the demons can see in there, and they realize you're afraid of nuclear war. So they all hang out, and they're like, hey, Bob, this, this chick's really afraid of nuclear war. And demons, like angels, can also look down timelines. And they can say, okay, she's going to obsess about nuclear war, And she's going to search every nuclear war site online and read about radiation poisoning. This girl's going to go crazy. We're going to stay here for a while. So then I get on there, right? And I'm I'm searching nuclear war sites. I'm searching everything. And what happens? 
Well, those demons can't make me do anything. It's very important to remember this. Darkness, demonic life, the devil, however you want to think about it, chaotic darkness, jinn, um, which jinn aren't actually technically demons, but we'll get to that. You know, they can't make me do anything. All they can do, all they can do is push my buttons and agree with me. So I'm looking at nuclear war. I'm freaking out. I'm reading about radiation poisoning. And I say to myself, oh my God, oh my God, I could die of, I could die of radiation poisoning if we're bombed. And Bob the demon over here is like, oh my God, she's on a roll. I'm going to eat big tonight. And Bob the demon says, yeah, you're right. You could totally die a terrible death if there was a nuclear war. All they can do is reflect back to us the fear that exists within us. Are you hearing me? That's how they eat. That's how they eat. So what you've got is a group of beings designed to eat pain and freak outs and dismay out of the ethers, hanging around people who put a lot of it out there. They can't make you feel anything. They can't make you uh, be afraid. Yet, boy, if you go into fear, they can mirror that fear to make it bigger. Then they mirror the bigger fear. And we get bigger and they mirror the bigger fear. And pretty soon we're freaking out and they are eating like pigs. Okay? So if we do not feed the fear... If we feed the light, if we are mindful that, yes, these creatures are real, yet they are not stalking us like the Bible says they are for the sake of hating God, they're just eating. And if we don't give them anything to eat, they will go away. They might try to, they get really desperate, I suppose, you know, reach in deep and see what freaks us out and try to mirror that back and see if we bite on it. But if we don't bite, they go away. Now, it is hard to get demonic oppression out of a space, out of a house. Why? Because once you've heard a demon growling at you in the dark, at night, right in your ear, and you smell the sulfur, and it's scary, and if you come from a Christian background or you watch any horror movie, you kind of know what that is, right? And now you're being told that the worst monster that your psyche was taught ever lived is real and in your bedroom? Oh, come on. That's hard to get rid of in your psyche. That's hard. I mean, you have to go into some serious Jedi Knight stuff to center yourself. And if that ever does happen to you, here's what you say. You just get real calm and you realize that whatever this thing is, is reading your thoughts and understanding that it's going to do whatever it is you think is going to scare you the worst. That's pretty much what it's going to do. Okay. So instead of that, go into a mantra. I invoke the law of love. I invoke the law of love. If you want to bring Jesus into it, go for it. You want to bring Buddha, whatever. I will tell you, this is interesting in my work, when I have been dealing with really creepy demonic beings, if I invoke the name of Buddha or I invoke the name of, um, you know, Mohammed, um, they don't do much for me. If I invoke the name of Jesus, they kind of wiggle off. Now, that's probably because, I'm not taking away from Jesus. Jesus is kind of a rock star, okay? However, um, it's probably because I relate the most with Jesus as an icon of light for myself, right? So I am able to transmit more light because I relate with the Jesus vibration, which is the Christed consciousness. I understand what that is. I don't really study Islam all that much. I mean, I, I know a little about it, but I don't study it a ton. So I probably couldn't align as much with invoking the teachings of Muhammad, all right? And also, there aren't just flat up aren't as many stories of Muhammad wandering around and dealing with demons, and there's more in the Christian Bible. So, you know, that's my go-to if I really get in a weird place. But, you know, if you're sitting there just repeating, I invoke the law of love, I invoke the law of love, and, and you're like, God, I hope this thing doesn't touch me, and all of a sudden it scratches you. Well, you thought two seconds before that, God, I hope this thing doesn't touch me. If you can just stay in that, I invoke the law of love, I invoke the law of love, and especially if you can direct it towards that being, it will get the hell out of there. It does not like the love vibration. It can't eat it, and it feels like vinegar on it, okay? So I really understand that that takes a little uh, mental practice, but, but for the sake of time, that's literally how you get rid of demons. And you can invoke the name of Jesus if you were a Christian person and understand that and relate with it. That'll work, all right? So, I mean, you could invoke the name of Jesus if you didn't believe in it. I'm just saying, whatever. These are just ways and vibrations that humanity associates with that kill the dark. And we do not need to fear the dark because there's nothing greater than light in the whole universe. So, the jinn, what are they? Um, it's really interesting because we have Western culture talking about culture, excuse me, talking about jinn like they're demons. 
Well, really, if, if you look at Islam, they really are played up to be uh, more like human beings, you know, that kind of mingle in the shadows with their weird eyeballs. And, you know, they, they live human lives, they eat and drink, and they live to be super, super old. They're more like vampires, right? Except for sometimes they're eating people, sometimes they're eating food. Um, you know, they, they, they can die, they need to procreate. And the big thing about jinn is that they are said to have been created by smokeless fire. And of course, humans are made of earth, right? So they're a different being. What jinn actually are, jinn are elementals. Jinn are elementals. They are a nature spirit. And they can get a little, they can get a little old west, um, honestly. And the jinn also, okay, if you read in Islam, they're also subject to the temptations of Satan and of the other types of demons that exist. Uh, again, important to remember, the Muslim religion does not demand that you subscribe to Satan or these icky beasts, uh, but they, they, they make mention of them, that they're there. Um, so if you got to remember, so jinn are subject to the temptations of Satan, um, and so they can be good jinn or they can be bad jinn. Right. So when you're hearing our TV shows and you've got Zach Bagans, God bless his heart, or whoever's out there and they're getting a gin, they think it's a gin. Well, it's not a demon. So you're not going to be able to cast it out using love and or, or Jesus name or Muhammad's name or wh whatever works for you. That's not going to work because they are fire elementals. They are the element of fire. And so gin don't like certain tones. They just don't. Um, Tibetan bulls work tremendously and that's one of the reasons why the Tibetan monks had those bulls, is it clears the ethers. Tibetan bulls will work on demons to a point, but it works to raise the vibration of the person more so than the demons really aren't responding to the tone of the bull, whereas the jinn are. The demons are responding to the, to the frequency of the person that's changing and getting peaceful and full of light and love. And the demons are like, oh, man, it's the vinegar salad. I didn't want that. I wanted the pizza. I have to leave now. You guys suck. So, so jinn, fire elementals, man. And, you know, evil jinn, you hear about evil jinn. And people compare them to, to demons, you know, where they could scar people or scratch them or burn them or possess them. Um, you know, and honestly, jinn are elemental beings, gang. They're elemental beings. And they're super rare to run across. And actually, you will run across more jinn in certain parts of the world than you will others. Because like all elemental beings, which are God's middle management for nature... They are grouped in vortex points on the earth because the earth is a giant electromagnet and has vortexes everywhere. And we have certain types of fae or fair folk or fairies or elementals in Northern Ireland than we do in the prior mountains over here. We've got a very specific set of elementals over there. Little people, they're called. So gin are elementals and the, 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 they do tend to pester people. I'll tell you, they're like gum on a shoe. So you can get them off by tones and continually keeping a high resonation. And after a while, if you don't engage the, the vibration of fear, you know, they go away too. They're a little harder to get rid of a demon than a demon. Demons are easier. Yet it all has to do with where we put our fear attitude, okay? So, I mean, there's so many when you get on there, I, I, you know, go to good old Wikipedia, which isn't always right. Yet Wikipedia had some really interesting summaries about the different types of demons and how people understand them. And I won't even get into Hinduism because our Western culture has completely demonized Hinduism. We wrongly categorize that particular religion as polytheistic. Hinduism believes in one God with 10,000 different faces, and they gave God 10,000 different faces to be able to relate with an aspect of God, okay? So when we talk about the, the Hindu, um, you know, the Vetalas or the Bhutas, we're talking about beings that by, by our Western lens are misunderstood as demons. And the bottom line is there are no demons in Hinduism, you know, because Hinduism isn't based on good and evil, and it's not constructed on the principle of duality like other other religions are. I mean, I'll tell you, demons sure don't think they're evil. They just think they're doing their thing. They don't think God is good. They think God is a vibration that harms them or is light. 
They don't have it out for God. They just, you know, I don't want to stand in a vat of acid. I don't think the acid is evil. I, we're just not compatible. Okay. And, you know, when you read the personified version of the Christian Bible, uh, of course, the demons are after us specifically to make us hurt, specifically to torment us, specifically. Well, they eat our pain. So, yeah, they might throw down a little bit if they can mirror some fear in us because they're going to eat what we put out there. Okay. But that's a very different reason then I hate you so much, I want you to suffer. Yet, again, a lot of the Christian lore talks about the duality between good and evil. Hinduism doesn't. So, you know, obviously there are powerful beings in Hinduism, but, you know, they don't actually get into the devil. All right. And that could be a whole pod. Hinduism could be like three podcasts. It is the oldest documented religion that is practiced by practiced, excuse me, by multiple people on the earth is Hinduism. And it is so complex. If you're not a, if you're a dualistic religion person, like a person from a Christian belief, I mean, it it, it will just completely blow your mind. So, but it's important to note, they don't actually have the devil over in Hinduism. And they don't insist that you adhere to a devil in order to understand Muhammad or Allah in Islam. Okay. And, you know, we talk about Judaism, and there's hardly any teaching roles assigned to demons in the Hebrew Bible, okay? Um, it's, it's not customary for the, the Jewish folks to have to cling to a devil in order to believe in God. You know, that the, 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 the Jewish religion is, is based very much on keeping the word of God and the laws of God, okay? And the laws of God had nothing to do with the devil. They had to do with how people should be acting towards one another and how they should be eating and how they should be spending their, you know, money and saving and helping others. And I mean, literally had nothing to do with the devil. So there is, you know, how many times hell is mentioned in the Old Testament? None, because it wasn't there. So this came later, again, please hear this, when the Christian New Testament was translated from the High Greek, and they lost cultural allusions to the actual valley Jesus was talking about, and they started folding in the underworld of Hades and fire, and wasn't there fire in hell? No, actually, Hades didn't even necessarily have fire in it. There was fire in that creepy valley where they were burning bodies and garbage. You see how this all got amalgamated and got weird? And we literally created our worst monster. Again, it doesn't help that there's actually such thing as dark beings and chaotic darkness out there. So again, you don't need to fear demons, okay? You don't. They are real. They may come through your space once in a while. They may be checking out if there's any pizza left on the, you know, fridge for them, whatever, Yet understand that you can acknowledge that space, but you don't need to fear it because it is not more powerful than you. And demonic oppression is a thing. You can feel it in the ethers. You can feel it in a room. It's gross. It's icky. Yet we don't feel very good to them either. Okay. And I'm not saying this to make you feel sorry for demons. I am breaking down their impervious monster status for everybody. So they'll quit eating on our planet. I'd really like them to eat somewhere else. I get called in so many times to homes where people think they have a demon or there's a demon with their child. You know, they're, if, if the child is an open channel medium and they don't know it and they're going through puberty and a lot of stuff and there's something pushing their buttons, you know, they're going to reflect that attitude. You're going to feel that dark energy come out of somebody. And I mean, I've seen somebody get completely possessed by a human spirit that was an open channel medium and he didn't know it. And we were younger and being stupid and drinking martinis and ghost hunting. And this guy got completely possessed by the spirit of an evil guy. And it was weird. And you can look right in that guy's eyes. And I was a friend of mine and he was changed. You know, it's so creepy. All of a sudden he's wearing my friend's face like a, like a bad outfit at Target. And and I'm just like, oh my God, dude, get out of my friend. The best part was, well, it's not best, but it was ironically funny. The human spirit that walked into my friend, because my friend was an open channel medium, didn't know it, and was super drunk. Bad combo in a super haunted place, okay? So this being walks into my friend, 
and starts trying to bully me and do all this stuff. Except my friend is so drunk, he can't get up off the floor. So the being that walked into my friend was a horrifying misogynist. And, I mean, he was a piece of utter just blah. He was still stuck on the earth because he didn't want to go to heaven because he was sure he'd go to hell. And he'd done things like rape his daughter. He was a bad guy. Okay. He was just nasty. So he's saying all these horrible things to me and all this god awful stuff through my friend and all these terrible sexual things he was going to do to me. And I just, I can't stop laughing. And this guy, this, this spirit is just screaming in this flat, weird, Amityville horror kind of way. Don't laugh at me. Don't laugh at me. I said, no, this is really funny, man. Because you possessed a queen. The guy that you're in is so gay. You were wandering around in a gay guy. And here you're talking about raping me. Do you know how hilarious this is? That guy would no more do that. I mean, the plumbing wouldn't even work, mister. I mean, boy, did you pick the wrong Ford to hop in and take a joyride? Let me just tell you. And boy, that spirit got so mad, but basically just lost its groove and left the guy. It was hysterical. <laughs> I mean, it was just like, is this really happening in my life? Oh my God. But there was a human spirit that walked into a human being who was an open channel. Okay. It wasn't a demon. It was a human spirit. It wasn't a demon pretending to be a human. It was a human spirit. It was easier to walk in. A lot of people can feel, especially big empaths, gang, we just got to watch our sensitivities because we are subject to picking up the vibes of spirits around us. And yes, 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 demons are real. Yes, they can possess you, but it's super hard for them. And it, it, the, all the conditions have to be perfect. You have to live in a particular vortex line that strengthens them so they can even do it anyway. I mean, it really, it's a perfect storm and that hardly ever happens. So don't worry about it. So I hope that answers some of your questions about are demons real? You know, are jinn demons? No, they are not. They are fire elementals and who are mostly prone to living into that, what was the Fertile Crescent area because of the geomagnetic index over there. It's more hospitable for them in the Middle East. Although they can pop, they pop up in a couple of places in the Americas, but not many, not many. You see a lot of them in Africa. And yes, demons are real. And yes, if, if we want to have any sort of creepy dark elemental spirit into our body, you know, I've seen that happen too. And that gets really weird. Elementals don't like people typically, but sometimes to mess with them, again, if the person is not aware of what's happening, they can put the person on like a glove. That doesn't happen very often either. Okay. So just know when you're watching your favorite paranormal show and there's a psychic on there and the psychic saying everything is a demon, everything is going to possess you, everything is bad. <laughs> That's a crock of crap. Okay? It just is. Yes, there are demons. Yes, they are real. No, I don't want to tangle with them. No, I, I don't like them. No, I don't feel sorry for them. Yes, I think they're icky. But no, they don't stalk me. And no, we, we don't even hang in the same spheres because they have their job and I have mine. Okay? So understand that there is nothing more powerful than light. That is the truth. In this incarnation, I'm talking spiritually, vibrationally. There is nothing more powerful than light. Horrible things happen to amazing people. We like to say there is evil in the world. That evil comes through human beings. We choose it. We make icky things happen. We do horrendous things to one another as, as a duality. We've been taught duality. Humans still as a species learn through contrast. It doesn't mean that we have a dark side. It means that we're still learning through contrast. We are light beings, period. And we're not sure how to have grace with our pain. So we turn it into darkness. I mean, I could go on and on and on about the dynamics of how we create evil on the earth. And there is what we could consider sociopathic, dark, vibration, or evil. That's a real thing. But let me tell you what. It's a real thing that tilapia eat bass poo. But it doesn't ruin the world. And tilapia do not possess people. And tilapia cannot make you do anything. And unless a person has a severe, severe mental illness where a, an individual just does not have command over their body. That's the only other time I've seen, you know, g demons or dark spirits take a human body for a joyride because that person is so loosely seated in there anyway that it's less vinegar on them. And the body's easier to control because of the psychosis. And it's really, really sad. So the more love we put out there, 
And the more we understand that we do not need to fear darkness because light is the dominion, light is the source. And I'm not saying that because I'm a pastor gang. I'm also a metaphysician. And on the periodic table, light wins in our incarnation, okay? If we go to that realm or that multiverse that's in chaotic darkness, I mean, light is still going to abolish it. But it, we're, we're going to have a hell of a time getting there anyway. Now, really quickly, we're over time. My engineer's flagging me here. We are over time, but I want to say this very quickly. What is hell then? You know, where, what is this hell that people talk about, people screaming and yelling and coming back and saying, oh my God, help me, help me, I'm in fire, I'm being tormented, whatever. Well, gang, you know, when people die and they're afraid that they're going to go to hell, you die in a, a place of fear. You've got angels waiting for you to take you to the ether that is perfection or the other side. That's just the way it goes. But if I am somebody like this creepy guy, he was this creepy guy who raped his daughter all the time. He knew from the Christian Bible that was not a good thing to do. So he was afraid he was going to go to hell. He didn't cross over. He hung here on earth and he wandered around this creepy house. Well, when we're a disincarnate spirit and we're wandering around, we're kind of fair pickings for whatever. And remember, demons can mirror to us what is inside of us. So it is phenomenal to me that when we hear about people who, who have witnessed somebody being in hell, and I'm not saying the hell dimension doesn't exist. It does. Yet what oftentimes people are seeing is the ether that is being reflected back to them out of their own consciousness by very dark entities that realize that, hey, one's out of the chute. If we just keep it here indefinitely, we can eat forever. This is awesome. And so they're mirroring back that person's ideology of hell. And it's fascinating to me how it always sounds like a movie. There's people screaming and yelling and, you know, chains clanking and there's fire and it just sounds exactly like Dante's Inferno and Phantasm. And in that chaos dimension, there's a lot of god-awful stuff, and I don't even need to go on about it, because we can't access that dimension, and I'm not saying it's impossible, yet I've too met, I, I have still met no one in my 50 years of doing this job who has died and gone to hell and came back as a demon. I mean, I just haven't. I haven't even met anybody who, I don't even engage that fear and creepy dimension, because it's so... It's so whack. It's just weird. And people's vibration is just too high for it. So yes, we can be trapped in our own hell. We can be tormented by these demons once we're out of our body if we don't cross over. That's not to scare you, but it's not like you're being drugged by your ankles down to a crackling thing and putting in chains forever. I mean, but that's what we think, right? Actually, the truest form of hell is the absolute absence of light absence of light. So if I can describe to you this place, it is a vacuum of nothing with the worst creepy vibe stuck to your skin. And there's nothing. There's no connection to your angels. There's no connection to spirit. There's no connection to people. It is nothing. It is unbelievably vacuumous isolation. It makes me sick. It makes me sick. I'm going to get off that ether. Um, it is the absence of light. That is, that is what, quote, hell, as we think about it in a traditional sense is. But it's very unlikely you're going to end up there because you are being of light. So know that. So I hope that helps everybody. If you have friends who are afraid of demons, um, you know, there's a lot of incarn disincarnate human spirits that pose as demons because we engage them, because we're fascinated by them, because I don't know why. Who knows why? Good luck. I mean, we're a species that eats pods that go in the dishwasher. Okay. I mean, whatever we do, we've, we've got, we got a ways to go sometimes. All right, gang, I got to run. I got to run. I'm so over time. I hope you have actually enjoyed this podcast and found it a little bit enlightening in terms of how to deal with chaotic, chaotic darkness if you actually run across it, because that is never, never any fun ever. Um, however, it doesn't need to ruin your life. It doesn't need to own your life because you are stronger than it is on the base level based upon the vibration of the spiritual physics in your body, period. Okay, so just know that, gang. And I want to put a shout out coming up April 8th, Monday night, live on Facebook at the Tequila and Tourmaline Facebook page. My wife, Rebecca Douglas, and I will be doing a live simulcast every Monday night, 6 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Mountain, 8 p.m. 
uh, Central and 9 p.m. Eastern Time. I will be covering the spiritual physics of health and wellness. My wonderful wife is going to be covering the, the physics, physics, the physical of she's a health and fitness professional of health and wellness, and she's also an empath and intuitive. So join us for Tequila and Tourmaline live simulcast on Facebook. And we are going to have a live call-in number, gang. So if you're watching us on the simulcast, you can call in and we can take your question live. Uh, And the archives of that podcast or, uh, yeah, the archives are going to be placed up everywhere you can find the archives of this podcast, which is iTunes, Spotify, TuneIn, Google Play, and Stitcher. So thank you for supporting the Patreon side, everybody who is. It's awesome to be in here. You guys always get these podcasts. We get a month's worth before the archives. We are so happy to have you over here on Patreon. If you're listening to this on an archive, you can find the most up-to-date episodes of Insight Radio at patreon.com forward slash Daniel Agnew. You can join us in here and get the latest episodes. So gang, go forward, radiate light, be awesome. Invoke the law of love and understand there is nothing more brilliant in the universe than the light within you. Everybody, I'll see you next week. 